Welcome to the Choralosophy Podcast. This is episode 109, Doing the Business of Choir with Alex Gardner. Do you think of yourself as a business person if you, re- if you lead a choir? I'm going to guess that most of you don't. However, I'm going to suggest here in this introduction that maybe you should. There are aspects of all of what we do as choral directors that we, we love to wrap up in the emotional, which is very important. But at the same time, we have to keep our ships afloat. And that is, whether they are school programs, community programs, church programs, whatever it is, we need the skills that oftentimes our school programs, our training programs, do not teach us. They don't teach us how, they don't teach us tax law, they don't teach us accounting, they don't teach us marketing. So I had a conversation with Alex Gartner about that very thing and what it means to wrap our heads as musicians around the business of doing music. So stick around for this. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Before we get there, though, just a few reminders. Make sure that you are checking out dciny.org. I was just over there on their website checking out their opportunities that they have coming up, and you're not going to want to miss their upcoming season. They've got Eric Whitaker, of course. They've got Heather Sorensen, Kim Arneson, oh my goodness, nerding out over here. There's just so many opportunities that you can check out. And then there are also opportunities for your choir as a solo ensemble to audition for a variety of different performing opportunities through DCNY. So head over there to dciny.org today and check out the opportunities. It is summer, which means it's time for you to be thinking about renewing your memberships to sightreadingfactory.com. Sight Reading Factory for you and all of your students. Have the school year ready to go with all of your memberships, your classroom set up, your assignments built, your rubrics, and of course, I've got opportunities to help you with that in a variety of episodes you've uh, I've done on the show. This is a great way to start the school year. You mean business, and you're also going to get down to brass tacks and get beautiful music made faster with sightreadingfactory.com. Enter Choralosophy in checkout, and you'll get 10% off your entire order every time you use it. You're also going to want to go over to mymusicfolders.com and mychoirrobes.com and check out their fantastic resources and products, a variety of things that you can equip your choral program with for the start of your next season. And again, enter Choralosophy at checkout for a discount. All right, everybody, I am here with Alex Gartner, who uh, is a children's choir director, a community choir leader, also recently an author. And we're going to be talking about the concepts that everyone who leads a choral organization really needs to wrap their head around uh, to move their organizations into the future. And so, Alex, I'm excited to talk about doing the business of choir with you. Well, thank you, Chris. and really appreciate you having me on. So who are you? Where do you come <laughs> from? Um, so, uh, like you said, I am a children's choir leader um, by ways of Cincinnati, Ohio, and now I'm in Pensacola, Florida, where I am the artistic and executive director of the Pensacola Children's Chorus. Um, and so I do a lot of work here. Um, we have nine choirs um, and a staff of 15, really big operation down here. Um, but I'm also a uh, singer, pianist, organist, and like you said, a recent author of this new resource with my dear friend and colleague, Emmy Birch, um, who I know has been on your podcast before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's a little, I guess that's who I am. <laughs> so let's actually start by talking about the Pensacola Children's Choir and describing that a little bit more for us, because of course, the vast majority of choral musicians who who claim that as their full-time job uh, teaching in some type of a school setting, uh, or and work in that or church setting maybe, and if and maybe and I I could be making up these statistics, but it seems like <laughs> that's what it's mostly school, and then a little bit of the church world, and then maybe even smaller is in terms of people who do this for a full time job that are working within community organizations. First of all, do you think that's wrong? Or am I right? No, I think you're absolutely correct. When um, you know, when we're at conferences and people ask me, "Oh, Pensacola Children's Course, tell me what that's about," they always assume that I have some other job on the side. Um, right. Okay. But no. It, yeah. So you're co- absolutely correct. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't just talking out of my ass because I do that sometimes. <laughs> and okay. So um, all right. So then tell us, since that is going to be a a little bit of a foreign idea to many of us. Uh, what is it like or what is it? And it, first of all, just tell tell us what it's like on a day-to-day basis to work for a community uh, qu- children's choir organization full-time. Yeah. So actually, I we get this question a lot because um, I, I have a full-time staff of seven. 
Um, and three of those are instructional. Um, so they're, they work with, on our programs. And so when we're at conferences together, we always have, people always ask us that exact question, what is, what is your day like? Um, so we, like I said, we have nine ensembles that rehearse um, uh, pretty much every night of the week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, and so obviously that's the part that a lot of people can easily grasp is just that instructional time. Um, so our rehearsals start anywhere from three and go until sometimes nine, depending on the day. Um, and we serve singers in grades one through 12. And we have approximately 300 enrolled in our resident choir program um, each year. Um, a lot of our um, organization is, is program-based. So the resident choir program, which is those nine choirs, is the big thing. Um, but we also run a number of community ensembles um, with our community partners. We work with a lot of other um, arts organizations and nonprofits and um, government entities to offer community music classes. Um, and so those happen sometimes after school, sometimes during the day. And so we have a team that works on that. Um, and then the other biggest part of my day, um, that, that's kind of my artistic director hat, but I'm also the executive director. And so um, the rest of that time is spent doing things like um, fundraising, grant writing, marketing, um, interfacing with our volunteers, um, interfacing with our parents, interfacing with our board, um, and doing a lot of work to advocate for the arts in our community. We have a great partnership with our local school district, and so we do um, a lot of activities there with them, professional development, we're in the classrooms a lot being resources. Um, so kind of that other, that, that element of, of a community choir that makes it full-time for us at least is being that, that arts advocate for youth in our community. We do that directly through our programs, but we also support a lot of other people and projects to make that happen. Yeah. Wow. So <clears throat> did you, and I, you might've mentioned this and I just missed it as we were coming on, but did you spend time in a classroom in a school as well? I did. Yeah. So point? when I. Yeah, early on in my career, I started, um, you know, I, I actually was an elementary general music teacher. <laughs> um, and then I uh, switched gears from there um, into a uh, more of a church centric world. And I and I upped my time in, with the Cincinnati Youth Choir, which is what I was working for at the time. And I became the assistant director for that. Um, and then I woke up one day and realized that um, I, I kind of was good at children's choir. And so I said, if I wanted to have, you know, upward mobility, keep going, grow my career, I was probably going to have to leave and find a, a job. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I applied for this job in Pensacola. And three months later, I was down here. It was a crazy whirlwind of events. But uh, yeah, I did spend time in the classroom. And I still spend a lot of time in the classrooms here, but definitely not on that day to day basis. Right. So the, the reason I ask is because what I'm interested in in, in, to kind of kick this conversation off is what are, what types of contrasts and or how did your perspective on choral music making with kids change when you left the education environment and went into the community environment or did it? You know, it, it did. It did change. Um, there is um, there's a great difference when you lose so much rehearsal time. So when you're in a, a school setting, a lot of times you get you get to see your kids every day or every other day, um, especially in the choral in the choral world. And, and I could be making assumptions there. But from my experience, a lot of times that's kind of how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you go into the community sphere, you don't get that that time anymore. So what you trade for um, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face time um, you, you lose that time, but what you get instead is you, you have an incredible amount of buy-in because in a community space, everybody wants to be there. You don't have, um, those kids on, on your roster who were put there by the guidance counselor because they had a free period. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a lot of that, um, kind of that, th that conflict or that dynamic of, 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 that in our, our rehearsal rooms, everybody wants to be there. So everybody really works hard and contributes. Um, and so that's why we're able to focus uh, intensely on skill building and artistry and a high performance quality um, in a really short amount of time. Uh, we usually, our concerts, we, we anywhere from nine to 12 weeks of rehearsal we'll have before we put on these big performances. Right. So it's great. Um, and, and of course, in the community space, too, I think we get to focus a lot more on 
what I call our own agenda uh, because we don't have that oversight of a school board or any or anything like we have a board, but it's their vision as well. So we do a lot of focus on social emotional learning, character growth, citizenship, leadership, all sorts of things, and we infuse that into our programs. Yeah, that's great. I, I I've have I have a similar experience because I, I work with kids every day in a school. But then, as you know, we just were talking about how uh, Emmy was here for the last week running our uh, our middle school choir for our summer choral institute, which the way I explained uh, those two parts of my world to the audience on Sunday was that uh, the adult professional ensemble that I lead in, in that community organization, that part of it is that, like, that's my artistic outlet that is, that that I need in some aspect of me to kind of exercise my my musical brain, but my kids at school are my passion, and I mm-hmm. need I need both of those things. And and then our summer institute is the way that I put both of those together. So that's just a little bit of context. And when you were talking about how uh, you lose some of the time, but you make up for it in f- essentially focus and buy-in and engagement, I see that same thing with our summer institute. In other words, mm-hmm. I get a lot of my my students from the school. They'll come and do it, but I see a more, a more focused version of them than I do at school Certainly. because because they are not worried about 19 other things that they have to do that day. It's like they're, it's a week in the summer for us and they, they're, they put other things aside and they, they it's just, it's choir time. And, yeah. uh, and so ultimately what we get out of that is we get a higher level musical product out of a lot of the same kids in a week than we get out of those same kids for in a two month period at school. Um, yeah. It's really remarkable. It truly is. And I find sometimes there's a a criticism of people who work exclusively in the community sphere that we are like kind of the lucky ones Mm. um, because we kind of get to do that on a daily basis. And, and I don't get me wrong. We still have all those same issues. You know, we have attendance issues. We have lack of focus that happens all the time, but sort of that, that, that spirit of collaboration and that buy-in is cooked into everything. It, it's kind of hard to get away from. So we're definitely lucky in that regard that we get to do that on a daily basis, but it's a whole different workhorse, you know? So it's great. Well, right. And, and it's kind of the trade-offs you were mentioning before. There are, uh, to say that you're lucky to get to do it, that's one thing, in, in depending on a perspective. But on the other side of that is also the fact that you, your entire operation is not funded by the taxpayer like a lot of public schools right. are. So you right. have, you've got a, so you could turn around and tell that public school teacher that they're pretty lucky too, because they're yes. paycheck, they're, they're a tenured and their paycheck keeps coming no matter what. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and that, that's, that's a big, uh, so, and that's actually one of the things that I'm interested in talking to you any about anyway, is like that side of it. Since you guys wrote this book, the business of choir, um, if, if you're running a choir as a business, there is a, a certain, lack of a safety net there that has to be constantly maintained. Whereas when it, for that part of my paycheck in public school, that is not my responsibility. I'm not, I don't need to be out there raising money, uh, right. nor do I need to sell tickets, nor do <laughs> I need to sell advertisements, nor do I need to sell like write grants. Um, you know, it, it, that's all baked into it too. And all I have to do is plan the concert, teach the music to the kids and show up. And if a thousand people show up or if 20 people show up, my paycheck stays the same. Okay. Right. So rant over. How do you see? <laughs> how how do you see that uh, in in your world as a as a quote unquote business person for choir? So I actually see that there's a, a really high degree of accountability in a community in a community choir setting. Um, while I might not have, um, I definitely don't have like that that safety net of funding um, to lean on, but. You know, a lot of people say that it's it, it seems so nice to be in a community space because you can kind of do what you want. And I actually don't find that to be particularly true mm-hmm. because we have to, we're funded by our community is essentially what we are, by the generosity of our community. And if we decide to go way off track and no longer honor the, the values of our community um, or sort of misconstrue what we're doing in a way that, that rubs people the wrong way, um, we are at jeopardy of losing funding. And that certainly was a big issue during the coronavirus for a lot of organizations. We got real, I was nervous for a couple month period there um, about kind of what we were going to do. But yeah. luckily, because we had this incredible buy in, we've been around for this, is, we're entering our 33rd year. We've been in our community for a long time. And so our community came 
around us and actually helped us think creatively on what we could do to continue to engage the community, to keep our name out there, to keep people coming back and seeing that we, we didn't stop, we're still working. Um, and so it was just really, it's interesting to think about that from that perspective, but the, the accountability is really, really high. And we've got always, we got to kind of find that nice thin line of how to, if we want to push the envelope, where can we push it without kind of triggering people in our community to say what's going on, right. but also um, we have to keep things fresh and new. You know, we can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. That's not exciting for me professionally or artistically. It's not exciting for my staff and, and our kids get bored too. So we can't just find the one sweet spot that the community likes and just do that over and over. We have to sort of kind of move the community along with us um, on our, on our board vision, which is right. a fun little challenge. <laughs> right. Right. So then when you're when you're sitting down to write a book about this, about the, the just the idea of thinking about the choral organization as a business, does that come mostly out of um, kind of your own feeling of, I guess, or experiences of success and failure in, in that community space? Or does it also draw on or target any other types of choirs? Like, do you think of it really just as a community choir book or who do you who, who should write who should read this? That's a great question. Um, we definitely wrote the book out of a more for a predominantly community lens, but we really tried to broaden that language to incorporate all types of choirs because at the end of the day, regardless of whether you have a million dollars in the bank or you're funded by the taxpayer, or whatnot, to build um, to build your 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 numbers to just sort of develop clout within your community to to gain students to get to generate interest. You have to really focus on your messaging um, and what you, how you define your choir's value. Um, kind of what, what's the point of singing? Why should I sing? Um, why, why is it important for me to be a part of this organization? Mm -hmm. um, and in the community space, that translates even further as to why should I give you money? Um, and so that's a really important thing to consider for all of us to consider, no matter what type of choir we lead. Um, in some, in every case, we are a part of a community that's larger than us. So, and if we wanted to grow, and that's kind of the, the subtitle of, of our book is to kind of magnify your organizational potential. Um, that's not the right words, but it's something along those lines. Um, and so when we think about that, you have to think about kind of what, what's the point of choral singing? What's the importance of it? Um, and when you can transfer that to a conversation with someone who's not a part of your organization, um, you can create a new relationship. And when you do that over and over and over again, you can get a lot of buy-in um, and you can actually help your, your choir grow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> you're, you're right that even though, as I was listing before, all the advantages that I have when I wear my public school choir teacher hat, um, not having to sell tickets, et cetera. Uh, it, it, you're exactly right that that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't have an incentive to build and grow the program. There Absolutely. are just certain things about it I don't have to worry about it, right? So, right. so then I get to I get to focus my attention on other things. But the um, but the the goals are still growth, public facing, um, sending telling the story about the program, you know, all those types of things. So what what are some of the uh, probably a good way to attack this would be you, you guys wrote different chapters that are kind of on different aspects of uh, of the choral business world of, of building the building the business infrastructure of your of your choral program. So how would you lay that out for us? Like if, if when a person goes to buy this book and give it to their board of directors, which I plan to do, um, because awesome. one, one of the things that are in our the community organization that I run is we're very, very small like very mm -hmm. part-time. I do all the stuff and we have, we don't have any full-time staff. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it is what I think is compared to Pensacola children's choir, where this, we're a tiny, tiny mom and pop shop. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have benefit from building an infrastructure that could like, as you said, maximize the, the scope of what we could be doing. Right. Absolutely. All the way to my church choir could be maximizing the scope of what they're doing. So uh, how would you lay out what's in the book for, for folks? What, 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 what issues did you tackle? Well, the Patreon just keeps doing its thing. 
you're missing out over there as it's just booming. I think people heard me say that I could do this job full time if people would all just jump jump on the Patreon and subscribe. I guess that's what happened. But head on over there. You're missing out on the Google folder full of resources, the monthly behind the scenes episode, finding out who the the guests are before they come on, the opportunity to have a direct line with questions for me. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and subscribe for as little as $3 a month. The show is produced there by Brannigan Lawrence, Chandler Smith, Vasquez Academy of Music, John Warner, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Jeff Wall, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. Yeah, so we laid it out in three major sections. Um, and to your point on like kind of the building blocks of business, um, the first section talks about value. Um, the second section talks about community and the third talks about kind of telling your story. It, it's not really advocacy because we didn't want to write the book on advocacy because there's already really great resources on that, but we kind of broke those things down. So the first section is about value, um, communicating your value, um, how to translate that value into dollars, AKA fundraising. Um, and then also there was a really great chapter by a guest author, Marshawn Hyman, um, on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, um, and sort of how to reorient your organization, uh, reframe your thinking um, through that lens. And that all combines together just sort of like, what's the, what's the importance of your, of, of your choir? And so all those elements combined sort of support that. Okay. The second section is about building community. Um, so we tackle that through the lens of um, recruitment and retention, volunteers and boards. Um, gosh, oh, there's a whole chapter on staff, personnel, if you want to grow your, your personnel. Um, and then just the concept of leadership in general. Um, and then the last section is about sort of telling your story. And we talk in that case about marketing, how people um, interact with your organization before they've like taken a step in the door. We also talk about that through finances, which I know that I definitely missed that accounting in the arts uh, class in my undergrad and my master's. Um, so in my role as executive director, I had to learn a lot of things very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last chapter is about evaluation, not necessarily evaluation in terms of like, I'm going to give my students a test and see how their skills have grown, but more about how to evaluate um, the various elements um, in your choral organization. And we actually break it down by chapter, the, the previous chapters, we give some suggestions there so that you can use all three of those elements to sort of outwardly portray um, kind of the, the reason that your choir is there and why people should join you. And then that cycles right back to the first section, which is communicating your value. So it's very cyclical. It's not meant to be, it can be read straight through, but each chapter stands on its own. You don't really need to have any prerequisite. If you are looking for something specific in those, in, in any of those elements, you can just turn to that chapter and you don't need to read anything previous. Um, but kind of the reason that we wanted to write this book, honestly, and, and lay it out that way is because I know for me, when I sort of have to explain what I do, um, I always get these questions like, oh my gosh, how did you, how did you get to that place? How did you, how did you raise all of that money? How did you grow your staff to that? And I'm like, and that people want like a quick answer. I'm like, I don't, yep. I don't have a quick answer. It's a, it's a multi-year process. Mm -hmm. um, and especially during the pandemic, you know, people were struggling and, and I was convening a lot of, a lot of zoom groups together of, of Florida choir directors, Southern region, uh, choir directors, and they were all asking, like, what can we do? What can we do? And I was like, I mean, right now, kind of nothing, because you needed to, we needed to have this infrastructure in place before. Right. Um, and so we just, and Emmy and I, you know, Emmy, the co-author, obviously, she built her group from the ground up, um, her Rise Corrals in Savannah. She started her own choir, and they're in, I think, year five or something like that. And I took over an organization that was, at that time, 26 years old. Um, and definitely not where we were now, um, but we've been able to grow our team and grow our fundraising so that we can be able to expand our programs. And so that combined experience really motivated us to want to share um, kind of that knowledge that's been built because um, there wasn't a class to take on how to do that. We sort of had to piecemeal a lot of resources together. Um, and so that's why we're really excited about the book itself. 
Yeah, that's great. So how would you describe, so if I were to say, um, why is the Pensacola Children's Chorus valuable to the community? Uh, how, how do you answer that question? So the Pensacola Children's Chorus um, is a choral organization, of course, at heart, and we really focus on high quality music, really engaging performances. But at the core of all of that is what the impact that it makes on the life of a child. Um, our curriculum and our programs focus on the values of responsibility, teamwork, accountability, confidence, and empathy. And those skills combined transfer not only to a performance stage, but to every element of life. So when a child comes to the Pensacola Children's Chorus, they might step in the door to have a good time, but they leave a better person. And so when I'm trying to engage a funder on that, all I have to do is sort of tell that story, maybe give a little testimonial from a kid here or there. And it's a pretty easy sell. Um, honestly, but that's, that's kind of what we do. We're here to change lives, right? Um, for me, so like, uh, everyone, everyone listening, doing. and that's, what's great about that answer because everyone listening should go back, rewind, play it back at, at half speed and write <laughs> all of that down. And then of what Alex just said, because then when someone asks you why your choir is valuable, that, that will, that will, should, and would apply to any choral program that is doing a good job. Absolutely. And, and we actually break down each of our chapters kind of in that same way that you just asked me to do. We have mm -hmm. a little at the end of each chapter, there's like some discussion questions if you wanted to have a discussion with your board or just have a, a discussion with yourself. But we also don't want to overwhelm people because a lot of it can be it can be scary because these this is not an overnight fix. So we have small action steps. And one of those it, it, that's the first chapter is like create your organizational mission statement if you don't have one or if you do have one. Does it reflect what you're doing? Does it reflect your impact? So it's just kind of great ways to start reframing how you think about the business side of choir. Right. So if I'm thinking about the, let's say I'm in a position and maybe I'm ask, I'm asking for a friend, like this someone <laughs> I, I do not know this person, but maybe I, I work for a community organization who doesn't have a great infrastructure set up. Mm -hmm. um, and and we're, we're in that wanting to grow phase. Mm -hmm. what, what would you, just in, in your experience, what is step one? Like, in other words, if an org, if a choral organization is going to grow, uh, where do they go first? That's a good question. And that for me, when I, when I get that question for, for other choirs, it's the first thing I ask is, well, what, what's your goal? Like, yes, I can, I understand that I want to grow. What do you mean by growth? Do you want to expand your roster? of singers? Um, do you want to um, expand your staff team? Do you, or do you want to do all of the above? That's really great. Um, but kind of the first step would be articulating what are your goals, you know, and then that's when you can start to unpack how to, to get there. I've already said a million times, it's not an overnight process, but when you write down what your goals are, you can start to sort of frame a pathway to get there. And you might focus on one thing at a time. Because, you know, if you're trying to just take an organization that's right here and go to this, that's not going to happen in a one year period. Right. But if you're trying, if you if one of your goals is to increase your enrollment, you can start there and focus on that element for a period of months or a year. And then you can start to see how that's growing or going. And then you can evaluate your success and then readjust your strategy, keep going, and then maybe also focus on something else at the same time. So you're just sort of scaffolding your growth. Um, but yeah, step one, define your growth. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine too, that I, I know for me, one of the biggest challenges over the years, um, that I've run Contra IKC as a nonprofit is mostly related to whether or not at any given time we have a board of directors who is interested in rolling up their sleeves and helping out. Mm -hmm. Um, because when, what we did was we started, of course, I, I was joking with Emmy while she was here about how you, for, you guys forgot to ask me to write one of the chapters in the book of how not to start a nonprofit choral organization. <laughs> and, uh, and I could have, I could have <laughs> gone back, gone back and, and, uh, talked about all the, all the laws I broke, uh, all the things that I did on accident because I just didn't know any better. Um, you know, and trying to figure it out all ourselves because ours, ours was started just very haphazardly. And the, the, our very first board of directors was 
uh, whatever the legal minimum was, which is three, I think. Um, and, <laughs> and it was, uh, basically just people who were willing to sign things. Um, but just so, just so that it would be legal. And then we were able to move forward from there. Now, of course, it's not like that anymore. It's, it's better now, but, um, I think one of the, one of my biggest challenges and one of our organization's biggest challenges is that, um, no, and this is a weird way of thinking about it maybe, but is that because no one depends on our organization for a job, then it's no one's job to build the organization, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so once, once you get kind of a team of people who, uh, who are invested in the organization, then a lot of that, that growth can start. Now, what, one of the things that I'm interested to, in too, and this is really just maybe a storytelling time for you, but during the pandemic, you've mentioned that a couple times when that was such, such a stressful time, um, for us, the, the pandemic for Contra I was not super stressful because we have no staff. Mm -hmm. So we were able yeah. to just pause, press pause. Sure. We'll come back when we feel like coming back. And there was no pressure for a salary or somebody who supports a family or their benefits or, or whatever. What was that like for you guys just uh, having, or in maybe, maybe even as the leader of the organization to have that weight on your shoulders? Yeah. So April of 2020, I call my, like my, that's when I developed true anxiety. Um, I had like several panic attacks that mm -hmm. month. I was in the middle of a, we were having a Zoom staff meeting. I was here in the office by myself. They were all working from home and they just started asking all these questions. Naturally, they were just asking like, what's the board thinking? What are you thinking? And I was like, I haven't even like, I barely got up out of bed today. And I just like the, the, it was getting darker and I couldn't sit and everything was getting narrow. And I was like, I have to go. And I just, I left the meeting immediately and I lied down on the floor of my office and just like had to take like several deep breaths. And thankfully that was really the only time um, that that happened. Cause after that happened, I went home and I talked to my wife and I said, we have to do better. We have to emerge from this pandemic, a better organization. Um, we have the time and the lug, we have the luxury of time to take a look at what we're doing um, in our community and decide whether we like that. Do we like our impact? Do we like the legacy that we are leaving? Of course, that is coupled with the stress of we still have to pay our people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so two things worked in our favor. Um, one is that about mm, five years prior to me coming, the board established a reserve fund. Um, and that was very small at the time. And it grew and grew. Um, and so we sort of had this little financial safety net. Luckily, because of our second thing that went in our favor, our, our, our relationships in our community, we never had to touch that reserve fund. Mm. Um, so we, we made it through um, without kind of tapping into our emergency funds. But our community partners really, I mean, I just started having conversations. I had conversations with our lead sponsors. I had conversations with our, our just people who have been with the organization for a long time, and they we just brainstormed what we could do. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to, um, we of course pivoted online um, for a little bit um, so we could keep people engaged. And honestly, so we could keep justifying charging tuition, mm -hmm. um, which we allowed people to reduce if they wanted to, or just leave altogether, no questions asked. Um, we allowed our patrons to donate their tickets back to us um, if they felt so compelled. Um, and then one of the biggest things is that our local news station, um, a marketing and a marketing agency approached us and said, hey, our community misses your concert. Can we do it? Uh, can we record it? Um, and can we televise it all for free? So we were able to build sponsorships out of that. And we were able to get a little nest egg to keep us through those weird months. Mm -hmm. And then through those conversations, because I live in the lawless swampland of Florida, um, we made the, the tough decision to return to in-person programming in September of 2020. Most people waited a lot longer than that, but our community was very insistent that we come back. Um, and so we weighed the options of not, you know, if we kept online, we were going to lose the remainder of the kids that we already had. And so we made the hard decision to, to return. Um, and we developed like a million protocols and, I listened to your episodes and so many of your episodes as we did that um, just to find a way to, to safely, to make a, a return to singing as safe as possible. And so 
it was coming together as a community to make that happen. Yeah. And so that we did that and we had no issues yeah. um, at all. We've never had an outbreak um, and we had in-person concerts. I mean, we lost a lot of money, you know, because we couldn't sell as many tickets as right. we would normally. But the yeah. important thing was, is that we kept going and we stayed present in our community um, and people continued to see us. And so because of that, support kept coming in. And so we made it through. And now we're a higher budget than ever. So it's, it all works together, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now. Uh, so do you feel like looking back on that time, you, you, uh, in the, in your story, you talked about how you mentioned to your wife that you, uh, that you guys have to come out of this, a better organization. You've talked about how you are now a, a bigger organization, but do you feel like it was, it, it came to fruition that the organization is also better and in, in which, and if you, if you think it's better now, can you describe that? What does that mean? Yeah. So, you know, with all the stuff that was going down um, with George Floyd and the racial reckoning um, during the pandemic, which I can't, just thinking back of just the dumpster fire that everything was at that time and continues to be in many respects, um, we just took a hard look at kind of everything, every aspect of our organization from the music we're singing, the, the venues we occupy, um, our policies, how much people are paying. We, we went through everything and said, you know, we have this great thing where, that we have a lot of kids interested in and they're going to keep coming back no matter what. But what about the people that aren't here? Um, what do we do about them? You know, we, we think we have the potential to reach more kids, um, but we also don't want to like radically leave our identity behind and just change everything um, to, to, to meet a different group of people. Um, so we worked with our relationships and our community um, and we started talking specifically with our city leaders. Um, Pensacola is a very um, segregated community still. Um, and even though we're a relatively small metro area, um, people kind of don't come downtown. Um, if you live on a in a certain area of town, it, it feels exclusive. It's the white place in town. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we were talking to uh, actually the, the president of our city council, his daughter sings in our program. And he approached me and said, hey, you know, I feel like what you all do has a great impact on my kids. I want it to impact these kids over here too. How do we make that happen? Um, and so we started talking with the mayor and the Parks and Recreation Department, and we're now offering four choirs in their community centers, targeted community centers. Um, and we also noticed that geographically, we, we serve a really wide geographic region. Um, our singers come from three different counties, and they're not close together. And there's a really big population of youth on closer up to the Florida-Alabama border up north who have virtually no arts in their community. And mm -hmm. so we said we could probably help with that. And so we created a choir up there as well, led by local people. And then we support the infrastructure of that. So they didn't have to get, they'd have to start their own nonprofit, which is mm -hmm. honestly one of the biggest hurdles which of people who have passion to do something in their community, but the legality and, and just the cost of making that all happen can be crippling. So we mm -hmm. decided we wanted to share our resources, share our wealth, um, but not in a way that we were going to just impose and be the, the savior, as it were. Um, we really wanted to create ensembles that reflected the communities that, um, that we're in and led by people of that community, serving people in that community. Um, so we have really, we, we expanded our external programming in that regard, but we also took a look at our internal policies um, and we're about to launch a brand new, um, we're, we're adopting sliding scale tuition, which is something that a lot of private schools do, but we certainly have it where we, where our families can basically tell us how much they wanna pay. Um, and then that way, that way we can confidently advertise to our community that our programs cost as little as $15 a month because there's a big access barrier to anybody who sees the word tuition and they'll turn mm -hmm. away immediately. Yeah. Um, and so just kind of that stuff like that, we're just a really stronger um, organization in that regard. We have a much healthier culture. And for the first time since I've been here, every single person who is in a leadership role catches the same vision. We're all working towards the same goal. We don't have group think by any means. We challenge each other, but 
because we all have the same why above us, um, we can just make a lot of great change and do a lot of great things with our singers. And so that's why I, th- I think we're better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about this right as you kind of came on, but just when I was talking about the the overall proportions of choral directors, at least in America, in the U.S., where we're mostly in schools and then churches and community organizations. Do you ever think about, or um, or if you haven't, feel free to react uh, spur of the moment, to the idea that uh, that maybe there should be more community choral organizations that are that are detached from institutions? You know, I don't know how exactly how I feel about that. I guess I can react here on the spot. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I guess I have to think about that. You know, I can compare my experience in Cincinnati to my experience here. So Cincinnati is a much larger metro area than Pensacola, and they support count uh, so many youth choral organizations. Um, in Pensacola, there is one, and that is us. Right. Um, and that certainly works to our advantage that we are the only youth choral organization in town. We are not the only youth arts organization in town. Um, So I I think there is, there's a lot of potential um, for um, just the, the, the benefits that a community choral organization can provide, especially a young singer. I, the, the problems that I run into and thinking back to my, my time in Cincinnati, especially, and even some here, um, that we're all competing for the same resources. So in, it doesn't make sense here in Pensacola to go necessarily start another youth choir. And of course, I'm definitely biased on that because I don't want that kind of competition. <laughs> but the town is small and it, right. all the arts organizations are funded by the same people, essentially. And so when you think about strategically trying to find a place to fit into to a community, if you're thinking about starting your own choir, um, I've heard too many stories of people starting a choir because they're upset with another group. You know, they, they were part of another organization and they're like, I can do it better. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do it better. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that, that actually is anti the community choir benefit because that's a very me focused thing that I can do something better rather than when we already have, you know, if this is a larger established organization, they have the clout, they have, they already have an infrastructure behind them. Why can't I be a part of that, a conversation to do better there mm-hmm. and ultimately create not just a community choir, but an institution um, that has a deep impact in the community and can impact so many young people. So I don't know, that's kind of my gut reaction. I don't, I'm all about spreading the wealth, but also I think we're better when we all work together. Yeah, no, I think you're. Uh, I think it it could be tr- simultaneously true that we need more community choral singing, and that it doesn't mean that it needs to happen in Pensacola. And right. in other words, yeah. there. Are, so if, if you know what I mean, so like you could think about it as a um, as a bo- broader spectrum. Because I've been thinking about that question for a long time. Because I I very much believe that one of our biggest challenges in choral music education is that we are having, we have trouble convincing people that there's a reason to take the class for a long period of time because there's nothing to do with that class after the class, right? So in the U S there's a, it's, it's, you know, it's not like the UK where there are these full, like oftentimes hundreds of full-time employed professional choral singers in the city of London. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't really have that. And so I mean, we have, we have that more now than we did 20 years ago, but it, it's still not really a thing. And so I always think about, well, like if there were more community-based adult and children's organizations that were, that you take the knowledge that you're learning from your choir teacher at school, you know, what's a quarter note, how to do re mi and all that kind of stuff. And then you were to take that out of the classroom and then use it in a, in the community because you just feel like it and because you're lo- you're good at it would make my job in the classroom a whole lot easier. Yeah, uh, because yeah, sure. They, because then I'm teaching them to to go use the skill in the same way that like uh, if I'm a if I'm teaching a shop class or something, then obviously those kids come because they want to learn how to fix the car, um, mm-hmm. and then they want to go outside the classroom into a shop and fix the car and get paid for it, you know that that kind of thing. And so I don't know. I think about that a lot, but at, at the same time, it makes sense what you're saying, which is that. Um, 
if there's a if there is not a need in a particular community for another organization, then maybe there doesn't need to be one. But I'm, I'm sure there are lots of places that do need it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think kind of in that same vein, you know, a lot of I think a lot of people get held up on kind of this, like, what's the end product of choral singing? Um, you know, I the, the words I've, I've even used them in this conversation, the word artistry gets thrown around a lot. Mm-hmm. We talk about high quality. And like to the lay person, what does that even mean? What does, what is artistry? What, wh- whose definition of quality are we using? And I think the pandemic really revealed to a lot of people, especially did to me, that honestly, the thing that is, that takes up a lot more of my focus now is the experience of my singers. You know, I can teach and I do teach musicianship skills, but if they're not having a good time, if they are not um, feeling valued, seen, if their interests are not being represented in the music that they're singing, um, they could lose interest in, in this. And to build, to, to have a pipeline from school to community, you have to keep interest. Um, and I think about those people, you know, who sometime or another was told that they're a bad singer or can't sing and <laughs> they give up and they can remember that person's name for the rest of their life. Um, but that was kind of that we infuse a little bit of that into the book is that when you're trying to build a, an organization, you really have to be careful about your messaging around what you're selling. What's your product? Is it the best choral music you've ever heard in your entire life? Or is it a fun experience or is it something else? And all of those reasons are valid. All of those products are valid. Um, and I, I know a lot in our field, we sometimes place a lot more value in the artistic element. But when you're trying to grow, you sort of have to put that sometimes at the side for a little bit because you're talking to people who don't necessarily understand what we're doing intrinsically. Mm-hmm. So you have to find an intersection for them to come into the fold for you to then teach them to value that artistic side, but we have to also value kind of those non-artistic elements of our, of our choirs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I I agree in principle. I I just think of that whole aspect differently than a lot Mm -hmm. of people do. And that I don't, it's hard for me to separate the two in my mind. Mm -hmm. So like, I I don't like the idea that I have to choose between art artistry and, uh, and belonging, for example. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, at least in my experience, um, kids are having fun and they're engaged and they're feeling seen and they're feeling like their interests are being met and are, are being uh, at least engaged. And a lot of the, th- the, th- the reasons that they feel all those things is because they're not distracted by the wrong notes and the wrong rhythms and, you know, all those things. Because in a lot of ways, sometimes those, it, ooh, this doesn't sound good, uh, can distract them from how much fun they could be having. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, so it's like, to me, it's an all the time, all, all the time these things hap- have to be happening. Um, and, and what's great about that, that the idea of the school to the community pipeline is that we can, in schools, uh, do, the, do the grunt work, so to speak, in some cases of having the kids where, uh, where, the, where it's for a grade that they learn how to do X, Y, Z. And mm-hmm. yes, we have, to do our, we have to do our best to make sure that they're also feeling loved and and uh, and having fun and all of those types of things but they have to get an A and one of the ways they get an A in my class is by learning how to musicianship skills and they have to be mm-hmm. able to read and they have to understand vocal pedagogy and they have to understand music history you know all those things and then in my I guess I'm now I'm in, in my dream world here where that that <laughs> work that that work where I do in the classroom then could support that community singing aspect to where uh, I am now no longer distracted by the fact that I don't know how to read the music or I don't know how to sing, and I can just go to the community choir, the church choir, whatever it is, and I can use my skills and I can just be in the moment. And yeah. but it, you know, it, it 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 takes work to get there. Absolutely, and a lot of community choirs. I mean, mine and many that I know. We we when we're talking with our our colleagues in the schools, you know, we always have to talk. The question always comes up as to why should we support your choir. Because there's this instinct, this instinct that like by recommending a kid to our program that they're going to quit theirs. Hmm. Um, and, and that sentiment that you just shared is actually the exact reason why that is not true. If they're getting fulfilled in, in a school program and they come to a place, if they, they have a proclivity for what they're doing and they really like it, we're kind of that like icing on the cake. Um, and so that's sort of how we 
are symbiotic in nature, the community groups and the school groups, especially at the youth level, yeah. um, that if we're all working towards a common goal and we're all doing it at the highest level that we possibly can, we actually create a stronger coral ecosystem together. Um, now, not every teacher gets that and not everybody in Pensacola gets that, but that's, that's what we try and do. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, so on the way out, let's talk about how to get the book and why, why people should, should bother. Well, uh, the book is available. The Business of Choir is available um, through GIA Publications. Um, their website is giamusic.com, I believe. Um, that's the best place to get it right now. It will be on Amazon uh, probably within a month. Um, and we will be also producing an ebook and an audio book within the next probably six months. So there's definitely great ways to engage with it. Um, the um, Emmy, through her podcast, Music That Matters, she, we're creating an online community for this resource because in our experience, one of our reasons to we were motivated to write the book is because we were constantly having conversations with our colleagues about these very elements. Mm -hmm. And so we're creating a, an online community and we will have a website called businessofchoir.com. Um, that's not quite yet live, but it is, we're, we're working on that. Um, but to your question of the why, I feel like every choir person, you know, regardless of whether you're in a school, a community place, a church, a college, you always have that, like that dream. What's that dream? Um, and a lot of times to achieve that dream, there are things that get in the way, kind of these non-musical elements that get in the way. Um, and as artistic, musical, music trained people, a lot of, there's a big gap in our, in our just body of knowledge, unless you have very happenstance experiences in, in a business-like scenario. Um, mm -hmm. Our training programs just don't have the time to teach us the important elements of kind of the back, the back end of leading right. a choral organization. And so that's kind of where this resource steps in, is that we can offer, a, it's not just a big picture view, but it also gets down into the weeds of how to translate these very specialized topics um, that have whole industries and whole um, professional skill development things through an artistic musical sieve so that it's digestible for the choir director um, who does not have to have a class in fundraising to understand how to fundraise, who does not have to be a marketing expert to understand how to market. And so that when you use all these skills and competencies together, you can actually achieve that dream. And you might find that there are some other dreams that you come up with along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great resource um, to help magnify your organization's growth and potential. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm excited about it. Uh, it's it's the type of resource that I wish that was out there when ten years ago when I was starting Contra, because then maybe yeah, I would yeah. have not. Maybe I would have not just hired <laughs> hired the lawyer I graduated from high school with who screwed a whole, whole bunch of forms up and you know all that. Oh uh, no. <laughs> Quite a I've mess. made a few of those mistakes yeah, along the way as well. You know, All right. Well, thank happens. you so much, Alex, for hanging out with me. And, uh, and, and I'm sure this is going to be a helpful resource for a lot of people. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, as always, for sticking around to the end of an episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Alex. The one thing I told Alex that was really, really important is that we didn't want to give away all the secrets of the book, but at the same time, we wanted it to be a stimulating conversation for you to be thinking about in what ways is your choral organization like a business? I know for me at school, there are business-like elements for everything that I do. Even though, as you heard me say, I don't have to fund my organization, I do have to keep track of the funding. I do have to keep track of the story that I'm telling. So I think this is a beneficial resource for a lot of people. So I hope encourage you to check it out. And at the very least, think about your dream as you heard Alex say. So I thought that was a great conversation and I hope you got something out of it. As always, if you did get something out of it, there are great ways that you can help. Use your Coralosophy checkout code. That's huge. Every time you go to Sight Reading Factory, mymusicfolders.com, every single time you buy sheet music at graphitepublishing.com, ryanmain.com, enter Coralosophy at checkout because all those great vendors will give you a discount. And that helps me out a lot as well. Leave a rating on the pod Apple Podcast app. Leave comments on the posts on Facebook and on Instagram. Follow all those places, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. These are great ways to help the show survive and thrive. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>